Okay. So uh, now we will have the uh, keynote uh, plenary speaker, Marta Civil, who will talk about mathematics teaching and learning practices for adults with a concept knowledge framework. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Marta, who's a very uh, good friend. And uh, we have been working uh, a lot, and we know uh, each other for many years uh, now. And uh, Professor Marta Civil, uh, she's a professor at the Roy, uh, I don't know if I say correctly, researcher in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Arizona. As you know, her research look at cultural, social, and language aspects in the teaching and learning of mathematics and participation in mathematics classroom. Connections between school and out of school mathematics and parental engagement in mathematics. She has lived multiple funded projects working with children, with parents, teachers, primary Mexican American communities. Her work is grounded on the concept of funds of knowledge and parents as intellectual resources, with a focus on developing culturally sustaining language environments in mathematics education. So thank you for being here, Marta, and the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, all right. I will be taking my mask off also in, in a couple of minutes, probably, because it's very hard to speak with the mask on. Um, so again, thank you so much to the organizing um, committee, and particularly to Javi, and, uh, and everybody who were involved in, in or not only organizing the conference, but in inviting me to uh, give this presentation. Some of it would be familiar to some of you, but I did add, I did select uh, an example that I haven't shared yet. Because I was a bit concerned, I didn't want to, you know. I mean, I'm always talking about the same thing, which is forms of knowledge, but hopefully with a different twist. So I'm going to start by actually sharing my LAM experience. Because my first LAM, the first one that I attended, though I didn't present, was in Limerick in 1997. So that kind of ages me right there. <laughs> and then I presented in the following ones, one in 15, which was in Philadelphia, is in parentheses because I didn't attend, a colleague of mine presented. But, and then I don't know what happened. I think, you know, summers got busy and, mm -hmm. and as I said here, I was supposed to present at LAM 26, but that's the one that got uh, canceled because of mm -hmm. COVID. And that's when I did, as I was referring to, I presented at the virtual mm -hmm. uh, webinar series. And of course, this is particularly special, this one, because I'm actually from Barcelona. I grew up here. Um, and, um, and I'm actually staying with my family and, you know, taking advantage. It's the first time that I see my family and friends here since before the pandemic. So it's been a very, uh, you know, very important uh, experience so far. All right, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little bit of what brought me to the forms of knowledge work, which is mostly based on working with children and teachers, not so much with adults at the beginning, though of course the families are involved and they are the adults, and then are transitioning to the work that I've been doing with uh, mothers in particular, which would be the main connection to this conference and the adults role in mathematics. So the reason that I got involved in funds of knowledge is that when I was teaching mathematics content courses for pre-service elementary teachers, I noticed that the more successful students, and I put more successful inputs, were less likely to make use of informal methods everyday type reasoning, and they would rather use a formula or algebra or school-like methods. While they're less successful, again in quotes, they often try to make sense of the problems by making connections to everyday life. And that to me was very intriguing, right? I was working with people who were going to be teachers, like the people in this, in this building that we are, <laughs> we are in, you know, and the kind of work that Javi does. So I became very intrigued by issues related to out of the school, in the school mathematics, started looking at studies on uh, successful problem solving in everyday situations, the so-called street math, Brazilian studies, and others. And, and that those same children were very successful in everyday, in adults, in everyday situations, but perhaps not, success, not so successful. And again, take the successful, they're always in quote, right? Mm -hmm. In school mathematics, in ideas about situated cognition, and that was during my PhD, and then I moved to Tucson. And in Tucson, Arizona, where I've been since then, well, almost, I took 
three years. He toured to North Carolina recently. I joined the Forms of Knowledge for Teaching Project, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, a little bit of a lesson on, in geography for those of you who need it. Um, here's where I am in Tucson. As you can see, we are about one hour by car from Nogales, both Arizona and, and Mexico. So basically, we are about one hour from the Mexico and uh, from the border with Mexico. Okay. And um, and then, well, you can see that Arizona is uh, one of the main states, of course, for the Navajo Nation. I know that people have been talking about the Navajo Mat Circles. I mean, we are, you know, we're right there. And personally, where Tucson is, is the Yoemi Native Americans and the uh, Oyaki and the Tohonona. So, for about 30 years, my work has been in mathematics education in Mexican, Mexican American low income communities in Tucson, Arizona. I want to stress that there is a wide difference in these communities. Some are recent immigrants, some have been there for generations, some are mostly mainly Spanish speaking, others are mostly mainly English only, and some are bilingual. You have to understand also from the history that that part, there are parts of, the, of uh, Arizona that were part of Mexico. So quite often the people who live there, they don't say, we, they, they say we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. <laughs> so you know, when you hear these debates about immigration and all that, you have to contextualize them uh, in a historical uh, sense. And that's why um, um, that's important to keep in mind in the communities that I work with. In any case, the children in these communities, in general terms, they do not achieve academically in the same manner as the children in other parts of town. So these children live south of Tucson, and you have the north of Tucson. The north of Tucson is um, middle upper class. The south of Tucson is uh, low income, uh, mostly uh, communities of Mexican origin. But our approach is a rejection of a deficit model approach towards the, the education of children and their families. And instead, and now we get into the funds of knowledge, our work is grounded on a social cultural uh, paradigm. Funds of knowledge, as I say, is a key concept, and this is one definition. There are variations on the theme, but they are all very similar. It's basically the idea, you can read the definition, but it's basically the idea that in any community, in any household, there is, there is knowledge that have experiences that have been historically accumulated and, you know, and, and culturally developed um, over the years. And that that's what allows these communities to get ahead and to thrive. And it is our responsibility to actually learn from these communities and build on that knowledge instead of assuming that they are lacking because it's different or because whatever different, whatever reason, it's not the middle class of our, you know, class of religious, it's not the white European. And another definition, I mean, uh, so the definition of forms of knowledge comes from the work of Carlos Perez, Ivanius, and Mr. Greenberg, and they refer to the strategic and cultural resources that the households contain. The project that I was involved in for many years consisted of teachers conducting ethnographic household visits, then meeting with researchers from the university in teacher study groups, debriefing those household visits, and developing modules, teaching modules to implement in the classroom. Okay, so that was the, the that was the original model that started, I believe, in the mid '80s. I joined it in '92 or so. When I, you know, so the household visits teachers would use ethnographic methods to learn from the families. And I want to express that it's learning. They didn't, they didn't go to inform the family about, oh, your kid is doing this. No, they went as learners. The question is range over you know, family structure, labor history, household activities. We added the mathematical attitudes when I joined the project, parental attitude, parenting, money, religion, education, ethnic identity. The teacher study groups, we did, as I said, the discussion of the household visits. We looked at implications when I joined the project. I mean, the project originally was more focused on biliteracy and, and language. And so I'm talking about the, my part, the work that I was involved in. Implications for the mathematics teaching and learning in school. And of course, we run into this dilemma for me, you know, how can we uncover the mathematics in context in which we may have no experience or knowledge, and maybe very different from our background in academic mathematics. 
So for example, if we, you know, we know that some of the families work in construction, but I don't know anything about construction, will I be able to understand the mathematics that they use? And then the classroom implementation. So in my work, the examples that I discuss are for school children, right? I've worked with elementary and, and teachers, school children and teachers. But what I argue here for you is that we could envision the same process in adult education. And basically, it would look as follows. We would do household visits by adult educators. So if you are now working with adults and you would visit the households of your adult students, you could do study groups where the adult educators discuss these visits, and you could do implementation in adult learning settings. So even though the work that I've done uh, has been with children and teachers and with the school, I don't see why not we couldn't be doing that with the, uh, in the adult setting. So now, moving forward, the, the household ethnographic visits, though they were very rich, for some of us, something was missing. Like, they helped us in the recognition of knowledge and resources, you know, among groups of people who have often been marginalized. But, as I said, something was missing. We felt, and I felt, that to a certain extent, the exchange was not on equal terms. The mothers, through a group, a literacy group that I joined or that I visited, we noticed that some of the mothers wanted to learn also about the mathematics. So us going to the household and learning from them was not enough because we felt like we were not contributing to their desires and interest in, in learning. And so that's why we started, we, we modified the model and we added this idea of parents as intellectual resources. And so now it's, it's the same thing, but then we add these parents as intellectual resources, which is those workshops, and I'm, this is in the next slide, where we exchange ideas and we engage in dialogue with the mothers. So here is the work that we do. So what do we do with them? I say mothers because most of the participants are mothers, okay? But they, we've had some fathers also. But uh, it's usually women coming to the workshops. So we have workshops, Math for Parents courses. The Math for Parents courses are usually like around eight sessions, or used to be at the beginning of the project, on the topics so of algebra for parents, fractions for parents. Um, and and they, they draw on ideas from school mathematics, but also as adult learners that we combine. Tertulias Mathematicas, that was, uh, so Tertulia um, is a Spanish term, and it's more like this idea of inspired by the literary circles, the get-togethers. And that's where we learn from each other and explore issues related to the children's mathematics education. And we engage in a more critical approach, which is something that we've seen in this conference already so far, where the, with the mothers we discuss you know, issues related to how they see their children learning, but also themselves as adult learners. Something that is very powerful is workshops led by parents for parents. <coughs> so now it's not us giving those workshops, it's not teachers giving those workshops, it's the parents themselves who are giving the math workshops. Another thing we do is classroom visits with the parents, where we visit classrooms in the school, and then we debrief. And particularly because many of these mothers were educated or schooled in, um, in Mexico, they see lots of differences, and it's really fascinating. Uh, from the point of view of uh, beliefs and views about what we value and count as mathematics teaching and learning. And then we've also done some occupational interviews. So for example, interviewing a seamstress, interviewing a carpenter, a welder, is to learn about the uses of mathematics. The key here is learning with and from the parents, the adult learners. That's always what guides our work. So what might adult education with the forms of knowledge orientation look like? Some key principles, I argue, is we need to develop rapport, confianza. So confianza, it's a word that is very hard to translate uh, into English, mutual trust, if you want. Um, Veres Ibanez, the person I was referring to, talks about confianza. It's a key word in, in the Mexican community and in other communities, obviously. The mothers use the word confianza. You'll see that in the quotes at the end. So it's this idea of, you know, I should say rapport, mutual trust, learning with and from them, learning together, being together. 
designing tasks that are both mathematically and contextually rich, where the adult learner can contribute their knowledge and expertise. And using teaching approaches that reflect the learner's cultural ways of being, learn how they engage in their everyday practices and try to bring that into the classroom. We've been doing some of this work with a colleague in New Zealand uh, looking at indigenous ways of with, with children, indigenous children and Mexican American children, and how they interact and trying to build, bring that into the classroom. Because different cultural groups of backgrounds, you know, we interact differently, as you probably have noticed any, any time we go to an international conference. Mm -hmm. Developing confianza. So confianza, as I said, is a key concept in the forms of knowledge work. That is Ivanis, 1983, this reference. It's the idea of developing mutual trust and highlights the importance of building relationships. How can we do this in the adult learner uh, world? Well, by hanging out, <laughs> literally by hanging out, which uh, basically just means being there. Just, you know, when we started the project, with the parents, we had workshops almost every day, and I would just go there every, to every workshop. I wasn't giving the workshop. I didn't need to be there, but I wanted the um, participants to see me as I'm interested, I'm here, and you know, so hanging out. By doing a community walk, wherever, you are, uh, wherever the center is, the adult learning center, or school, you know, do a community walk, look at the resources, look at what they have, getting better into the community home visits, as I've explained. And something that we've been doing more recently, which is a little bit, perhaps, what, well, much easier to implement, getting to know each other through a forms of knowledge conversation activity, which I'm going to explain next. This is a more recent development. So, the forms of knowledge conversation activity, originally, it was intended for teachers to role play among themselves prior to going to do it, to doing the home visit. Okay. So it's, it was a subset of the questions that they were going to be using when they do the home visit, and they would role play. But in a recent project, we adapted it to use it as a conversation between parents and teachers, because we have parents and teachers now in our project together, working together. And that way they learn about each other. And I argue that this could be used to have conversations between adult learners and the instructors and facilitators. And basically, it's similar to the forms of knowledge tool. So we have some questions that start with, you know, where are you from? How long have you lived here? What languages do you speak? You know, whatever you are interested in. But it's a conversation. So we pair usually a teacher with two mothers, or two parents, or teacher and parent. Or, you know. You're experiencing in mathematics. So how do you run a school in math um, uh, mathematics in a school? How do you think you use mathematics in everyday life? You know, they engage in that. Everyday activities, the traditions, the jobs. So, for example, in the Mexican community, they might talk about quinceañeras, or they might talk about what they do for the Day of the Dead, the Day of Muertos, or you know, and then the languages. And so, that has been actually quite powerful in establishing rapport between the teachers and the parents in the project. And that's something that is relatively easy to implement, and perhaps. You know, rather, particularly with COVID, the home visit was not really an option anyway. So, mm -hmm. so again, in this, confianza is key to learning with and from each other. It opens the ways to finding out about their interests, expertise, and their forms of knowledge. Okay. So that was confianza. The second criteria that I have was the tasks. So the choice of tasks, learning about learner, learners, forms of knowledge can inform our task design. This is similar to what we do in the forms of knowledge project with the children and the teachers. We have been exploring using tasks that are likely to draw on learners' expertise or familiarity with the context. So for example, with a group of mothers, they talked about making tamales, which is the picture to your left, um, which is corn masa with uh, chili and cheese. And they're very good. And, um, and so they still owe me some tamales, by the way. But, um, but yeah, so they talk about making tamales and then how, what does it involve, and then you can design, and, and they are the experts on that. Mm -hmm. The middle one is papel picado, which is very common in the Mexican uh, community, which is basically they use it to decorate uh, artists. And 
the one to the right is more recent. You haven't seen this one. Uh, it's not the sugar skull, so this is a more recent project that we did. We gave them a recipe to make the sugar skulls, which is very typical from Day of the Dead in, in the Mexican culture. And then there was a picture, and there was different sizes. And they had, it was kind of a modeling activity. And they had to estimate, come up with an idea about how many ingredients they would need to make the different sizes of, of sugar skulls. But it was all very um, you know, open-ended, ambiguous, on purpose. Um, so, so that's one of the types that we use. Another one is the paper flowers. Another one is um, some mothers, I mean the ballet folklorico, the, the, the dresses for the ballet folklorico, they know how to make those dresses and so the whole you know, math involved in making those dresses is pretty amazing. The one with the popcorn has to do with sharing, so this is more a common experience that we all have. You're having a movie event at, at school and you have these bags of popcorn and you know, how are we going to do it? And the last one has to do with an activity where we gave them these kind of tables, I mean, and they're going to have a party and how many tables, and so they chose the motivator, the reason for the party, and they, they get to bring their own contextual experience to the program. Okay, so we're going to look at one in more detail. So this task was adapted from Aguirre and Zavala, and you know, I have the reference, uh, and also this, this is where I took it from, but this is a math modeling task, so this was quite different from what the group of eight mothers that I'm going to be talking about had seen before, in that it was very open-ended and involved making assumptions. And the task is the following. Yeah, you can read it. Okay. The reason why I'm asking if you can read it is because now you have to work. I am actually going to put you to work for a while. Uh, but so, so this is the task. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like to spend a few minutes working on the task and hopefully discussing it with people near you uh, before I talk about it. So here is the task and just do whatever you want with the task. Hopefully you can read it. Yeah, I thought that you had to do your work. You know. huh? What do you think? <laughs>
actually comes, the original task was based with adults, and I'll explain in a second, but we use this one because that's how it's been developed for this modeling project. So of course it could be changed to reflect the original, which is what is in Aguirre and Zavala, 2015. Then of course it can lead to a discussion of what is fair when people have different resources. So you can actually move it much more into a more of a political discussion into one. And while the mathematics is not particularly challenging, the task requires making assumptions, decisions, and justifying them. Mm -hmm. And it involves a communication, it involves, you know. And this is what we saw the three groups doing. They all came up with different approaches and the discussions were very lively. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were really, it's like they got really engaged. Mm -hmm. So group one, we have Magali, Victoria, and Laura, and what they did is that they decided to extend it over two months. So they did not want, they, their, their, their assumption was they didn't want anyone left with no money. So each month they kind of would save a little bit. So instead of doing it in one month and be done, and so basically okay, these are the numbers and you know, they each gave half. And this gives them 120, so now what do you do with the youngest one who has the $8 in the piggy bank, right? right? So there was a lot of discussion. They said, oh, maybe you can contribute to the car or the paper to wrap it. You know, but it was kind of left like, yeah, I don't know. When they presented, we don't know why, when they presented to the whole group, <laughs> they had a different approach. It was still over eight weeks, but now they each gave $40, and I don't know how they did that. They assumed that the youngest was getting $8 a week every time in the piggy bank, which of course, one of the groups says, well, then I'd rather be gender because I don't have to do any work and I'm getting $8. You know, so you get into this discussion about how does that happen, right? And so this created a lively discussion because if you think about it, four, well, one of the two things, the others realize that four times 40 is 160. But instead of like, like they would say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you already have, but then they right away get into the trying to help them. And says, oh, you know what you could do? Instead of $40 each, they could each do $30. And that way, if you notice here, I don't know if you can see it very well, maybe not because of the reflection. The fourth, the fourth grader, if he or she, I don't remember now, gave $40, they wouldn't have had anything left. They were left with zero. Mm -hmm. But if they gave 30, see, they would, they would, then they would have $10 left, okay? And then of course, oops, sorry. One of the groups challenged the interpretation that the youngest was getting $8 each week because this well, doesn't make any sense. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in, in this other group, um, they chose to be done in four weeks. And in fact, Esmeralda, who was in this group, commented on the prior group and made a joke and said, if they have to wait eight weeks, the, father, the grandfather is going to be 71 at this rate. So it kind of relates to the when you come, right? I mean, <laughs> turning 70, they have to wait so long. So there was this joking around about eight weeks, that's too long, we can do it in, you know, in four weeks. For this group, the important aspect was to be done as soon as possible with everybody contributing everything, well, except the youngest one, right? So each child gave something, but the, young, the youngest one, except the youngest one. And what is interesting here, that of course, when the second group presented, the others wonder about the young one, who was not contributing anything, right? Because they didn't think that this was fair. And so Esmeralda, who is in the group, she says, the young one, since he doesn't work, he doesn't contribute. The others will earn money again. But Magali, who's in the other group, says it's not fair because if they are going to sign the birthday card, they have to contribute. <laughs> so you get into these this discussions in which you learn also about their approaches and their beliefs, and you know, and the the group Santa Esmeralda Marina stands up for the young one. He's very young, like come on, you know, you cannot make him. But then Magali says, yes, but the young one is going to feel bad if he doesn't contribute. So there is this sort of like, you could interpret the first one as, if they're going to sign the birth card, they have to contribute, but then Magali says, no, the young one wants to contribute, so you should give him the chance. And then Magali suggests the young one could give $2 to each of the other children, and he would keep $2, okay? So that's a possibility. And group three, and of course, for me, this is interesting, because this group, um, there were only two in the group, but Lydia was very, she worked as an accountant. She was probably the one, and she was basically the, the, the one that would always solve the problems in a very somewhat, you know, standard way. And of course, we have three different proposals. 
and, and for them it was very important to keep some proportionality so that those who make more pay more. Okay. So anyway, so the options, you know, uh, one option similar to that of group two, the other one over six weeks, you know. And the rest of the participants, you know, they engage in this lively discussion about which option they prefer and why. Yeah. So, as we close the discussion, I share that the case was based in a real, uh, on a real event. The original task was about three adult siblings sharing in the cost for a party for their father's birthday. And the three adults, one of them being Aguirre, Julia Aguirre, um, who probably knows, um, basically it was, it was really a reality. I think she has a brother who works as a doctor, so makes a lot of money. Mm. Then Julia, who's a university professor, and then her sister, I don't know what she does, and has family and whatever, so makes less money. So it was this situation, so it was all based on that. As I share this, some of the mothers started sharing their own experiences in similar situations. Like one of them says, and in fact one of them asked me, and how did they solve it? She wanted to know how Julia, the original, <laughs> had solved it because in her case, this mother, there were 10 siblings. And they had had a similar situation and, you know. So it was fascinating because all of a sudden everybody had something to share. Mm -hmm. So this realization added a personal involvement with the task. While it was likely that people had similar experiences, at this point is when they went ahead and shared those. And again, then you learn about, you know, if you're building community, you learn about their experiences, there is this notion of confianza, they felt comfortable sharing somewhat personal things about, there were two, I think there were two families, uh, two mothers there with very large families that shared something. So what did we see when they were working on the pro program? We saw engagement and enjoyment. We saw working together towards an approach and a supporting, uh, providing a supporting arm. We, we showed this concept of sophisticated collaboration from Rogoff and colleagues, which I'm fascinated by, because basically what, what Rogo, Barbara Rogoff and her colleagues talk about is this idea that in, what they've been noticing is that indigenous communities, both in, in the States but also with Mayan communities, kids and adults can collaborate naturally. While in, in the more western part of the, you know, um, part of the US, in terms of the, the the white, we, have, we teach kids to work in groups. We put them in groups, we give them roles, you know, the whole thing that we do. And says so this comes natural to these kids. They support each other. So this concept of sophisticated collaboration that I find very, very intriguing because that is a strength that these children bring and we don't necessarily acknowledge it. And yet we do this thing with the roles when they don't need roles. They already know how to collaborate. You know, and she shows these videos, it's, it's very interesting, it's, if you, you do it YouTube or Google, you see this, where you see two siblings, white European, one pushing each other, or they divide. The typical is that they divide. You do this, you do that, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not how the indigenous uh, communities that they've been working in. So for me, that is a very interesting idea. They're using mathematics in their own experience to provide reasons for their choices. They were arguing and challenging, because they were challenging each other, they were not accepting. But, but they were also supporting each other. Like when they were helping, they said, oh, you could do this, you could do $30 instead of $40. This type of task allows for the participants to be themselves while working on it. That is to bring their cultural ways of being that I was talking about earlier, um, the work that I've done with my colleague in New Zealand. And it's where the in-school and out-of-school border is blurred. So I have a few takeaways for the closing is at the heart of this at the heart of this work is the importance of building relationships and developing an environment where adult learners feel safe to share their ideas about mathematics and in the young. So that's the key principle. As I say, in these sessions the women support each other's learning. They enjoy the challenges. There is laughter and joking while persisting on the task. Well, the initial tasks, when we start the work with the mothers, are usually grounded on what the children are learning, because that's why they come to this workshop. They come as mothers. 
very soon we move to more open-ended tasks that have nothing to do with what the children are learning, and they are like, like they're ready, that's what they want. They want to learn as adult learners for themselves. As much as possible, and this is working progress, we try to learn from them, so that we do it, but then to devise tasks not only based on their experiences, but ideally with them. We are not quite there yet with the co-curricular, the co-development of tasks. A little bit of the tamales task that I refer to a little bit. So, I tried uh, after the sessions yesterday, I went, I was home, and I decided to make some connections about my, my talk and what I had just heard that I am so far, just very big connections. So, the first one is, central to our approach is the firm belief that we're all learners and that the adult learners have rich mathematical knowledge and experiences. And that's related to the first plenary uh, that I heard of Ramon Fletcher's talk. Okay. Maybe similar comment. I also attended uh, some other stuff, and in there, you know, again, what we do here is the tasks we use are contextualized in their experiences, which is something that in this talk also. We want the mothers and adult learners to question what they are learning, to not just accept it, to be critical. And that was, you know, that was um, a talk. And finally, we're constantly looking at what counts of mathematics and the central role of power. And that was in power of error stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I saw right away some connections. So I'm going to end with a slide with a few quotes from the from mothers throughout the years. Not, not, in fact, none of them come from this particular task that I show you, I don't think so. Um, but they capture some of what I've been saying across. For example, this mother said, in a regular classroom, we would not have learned it like this. Here we learn thanks to the camaraderie and confianza. And again, these are their words. In Spanish, obviously, but confianza stays in Spanish. <coughs> Thanks to the confianza, another mother, that exists in the group, we can work with our problems and pose any sort of questions with our fear. Mm -hmm. It is a very different form to learn. It's a friendship relationship, not a teacher-student relationship. Mm -hmm. The importance of relationship. I love this one. I've shared it before many times. No one is going to mandate that it has to be the way they say, because we also think and solve problems. Mm -hmm. The last one is, I get excited because now I know I'm not accepting it. Now I know why that is the way it is. And I see lots of connections also with the talks that we heard yesterday to the voices of these mothers. And I'm going to end here because I always end much earlier than this. That way we have time for a discussion, hopefully. So thank you very much. And these are the last.
because they are so, I mean, not every family is going to well be open, but, but many are, and they are so appreciative that the reason why we are there is because we want to learn from them. And to be honest, I mean, just to share something, I remember my first interview, this was not a home visit, I did an interview once with a mother and a child. They didn't know me from anything, but there was a broker, there was a woman in the community who says, oh yeah, yeah she's going to be doing some workshops, and she's like, she's cool, you, know? she, you can trust her. And I'm interviewing this person, and we're talking about mathematics, you know, things that, and then she starts sharing very, very personal things. I mean, I'm talking really personal. And I was getting goosebumps, you know, right? and I'm thinking, what is this? and I'm recording it, right? And so at the end I go, well, thank you so much for sharing this. And she says, no, thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. And so there is this, this idea that, you know, you get into the house, um, and as I said, the difficult part is, is to leave. And I've done some home visits, and sure. I mean, as soon as you come in, they right away, they offer you something to drink, they want you to stay for dinner, they want you to have a say, yeah. So that was the first part of your question. The second one was about the group, the coming as a group, or? Yeah, so scattered, just come together. I just, my first question based on, I was thinking of my own situation, and I would imagine there would be a reluctance that people would feel exposed if you see their homes, particularly in disadvantaged kind of areas. But then I wondered, you know, how easy was it for them to get in with other commitments? So, yeah, so, and, and actually going back to the home, so many, some of these families that I visited, they, they live in, in uh, trailer parks yeah. and, and, you know, quite a few people in the home. And, but it's like, that is their life. They are not, I mean, they, they know, I mean, obviously that some of us come from different housing arrangements, right? But they are so welcoming and, and so, and plus, many of them, what happens that many of them are very good because they don't have the money to pay people to do things. They have beautiful, and, and, but they're very good at doing things. You know, they have beautifully manicured gardens and things. I mean, so so even in the simplicity of what you think is, it's it's beautiful. It's welcoming. It's like you walk in and you know. So so that part. I mean, as that in terms of coming, it's always tricky. It's always tricky to organize these groups. Usually we start with the schools. I mean, all my projects have been school based except. One project that when ended, some of the mothers wanted to continue. And so then we went to a public library and we, st we kept meeting for a year. That actually was the best setting. That's what we call the tertulias. They started pretty much there because it, it got us away from the structure of the school. But we tried to do that actually with uh, the group of mothers that, just, that I shared the, the work you know, with the Papa's birthday. We were going to start working at a public library. We had already a public library set up. We met there March of 2020. We mm -hmm. met once, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't really restarted yet, you know. So I think that a community center, a public library are good places for this kind of work. Um, but it takes, um, yeah, it's not that easy for them to continue coming for, you know, Commitments and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One more question, uh, Kathy. Kathy. Marta, uh, do you are, do you progress in these towards mathematics, uh, or mm -hmm. to the parents asking? Uh, and I guess that because when I did, you, you're familiar with my research, uh, and at the end, the t they would always say, "But how would you do it?" How would you solve that? Excuse me, So, are, are, when you structure your exercises, are you moving it more towards looking at things from a, not formulaic, but you know, where is the underlying mathematics that you're comfortable with being able to do so? Yeah, we do, we do a lot of um, combinations. So, for example, a task like the one I presented, no, because it was kind of an open ended, you know, whatever you decide, you decide, and if, if it makes sense, you know. But, at the same time we do this, that we do this task, we might do some tasks that are more traditional or fraction, you know, rational number or whatever. And so we start with something more informal and then we introduce more, like for example, we did something, the grad student that was working with me did something with decimals and, and she realized that they were having 
not a very easy time with decimals. So then she went and looked for materials and did what you would do with pre-service elementary teachers with decimals. So we do a combination because, well, A, they want to see, we also ask them to bring things that the kids are doing or questions that they have from the mm -hmm. kids and we use that as a, as a launching pad. So we, we really combine uh, things. We don't um, really completely, for lack of a better term, informal math. We try to also do some of the more traditional mm -hmm. school math type things. Yeah. For example, in, 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 the, in the US, the United States schools now, it's very common to use influenced by the Singapore math, the strip diagrams. And so one of the first workshops that I did with the mother, mothers in this most recent project, I started with the strip diagrams. Because I knew they had seen their kids bringing that, mm -hmm. and it's so foreign. Mm -hmm. I've never done a strip diagram, it's like, it has no, and so they were like very appreciative, you know. And so I basically, I, le I lecture, you know, I just said, this is what it looks like, let's use it, blah, 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 and yeah. It was a combination. Yeah. Yes. So, I will speak aloud because it's difficult to hear over there, I assume. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marta. This is very inspiring and gives a lot of very uh, exciting uh, examples for, for ways to, to go outside traditional ways of teaching and also educating mm -hmm. teachers. I want to raise uh, an observation regarding the focus on mathematics, okay, and doing mathematics. Somehow, this goes a lot into things that involve computations or geometry or, or numbers in some shape or form. And I think that if we think of adult learners, we need to also pay more attention to the way mathematics and statistics are used in the adult world, in the public sphere. So for instance, all of these parents probably watch television and read newspapers, community newspapers, state or city newspapers, how do they interpret the information there? What sense do they make of the statistics that appear there that may pertain to injustice or to, I don't know, any other social phenomena, crime in the community, economic issues, pollution and so on and so forth. These are essential issues and they involve interpretation. So it's not about doing and computing and so on, it's about reading and interpreting and discussing uh, how people understand or don't understand and miss communications and so on. And I think these are things that could be applied and, and adapted to the adult world in some way, but they may not be appropriate for the teachers that work with the school children. So I wonder if you have any thoughts or maybe other experiences from other things that you have done over 30 years that can educate us about how to apply something like this outside of the world of computation? Well, yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. And our examples, the kinds of tasks that we've done have, been, have not been very controversial, for lack of a you know, I don't, you know. So they haven't touched on any of these. Uh, you, you were, when I was listening to you, I was thinking of an article for many, many years ago. I think it was Magabina Anusha Suleiman with the Brazilian and, and adult learners and reading, interpreting graphs of, you know, of some economic and, and how they were interpreting it. And we haven't done much. I mean, we've done something with graphs, but it's never been contextualized in anything that would be of significance, for lack of a better term, you know? So the closest I was thinking, I'm going to put Javi on the spot now. Javi. Um, the closest, that, the closest that I can think of is when, 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 when we were doing this work and Javi was in, in Tucson, we tried to do more social justice type of activities. And so, for example, we did, and I remember because he did that, the 10 chairs of inequality from, uh, um, from Rico Woodstein's book, which, by the way, is here and, and Savala is from the second edition of the book, by the way. Um, and so discussing, you know, the economics, the distribution of wealth, you know, Around the, around the world, and, and I don't know if you remember that, having been there, the, te the 10 shares of inequality. So we try to do a little bit more, and this is where things get tricky. We also did something with, um, uh, we started the tertulias talking about achievement in the school and how is it that children in that particular part of town don't achieve as well as, all, you know, and, and talking about 
which is possibly more politically charged than talking about Patti's birthday and her gift, you know. But I always have to be very careful and, and, and Rico Woodstein writes about this, but how much can I do that on one hand is going to make them you know, more informed and more, but at the same time it's not going to dwell on despair and create a situation which I want to feel worse. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, if you start discussing certain topics, are they going to feel even worse? And I, I, and I don't know. So I think, as I was listening to you, we do need to do more of that. I think the grad student that I'm working with, she wants to do for her dissertation, she wants to work only with the adults, not, not so much as connection with the children. So she might be more interested in, in pursuing that line. Because if we have to work with the children, then the tasks have to be a little bit more like, you know, whatever, yeah. But, no, but thanks, this is very important. And if all people have ideas about, about tasks that we, you've implemented, you know. I think that, well, climate change is such a controversial topic, <coughs> topic in the US, in every, everywhere, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I don't know if I can, but I remember one of these tasks uh, in one of these uh, workshops, and I remember we provided like a mathematical object, like a graph, to the to the families, and we asked them to make sense of this graph. So, of course, they came with their own interpretation of what does it mean, this line on the, mm -hmm. on the paper, and it was very amazing, because some of them, they were related, they relate this to the energy in a week, so you start oh. with uh, money, oh. energy, and then, uh, you know, uh, or they, they thought, okay, in the, in the diet. Other people, well, it was very interesting the way that they were connecting, like a single mathematical object, which is a line, it's a graph, with their uh -huh. own uh, interpretation. So that was a very powerful. Yeah, and more recently we used similar thing, and one of the, but it wasn't, it was still not getting to what we are saying. One of the mothers talked about the level of peacefulness going to church. And so it basically it's kind of funny, right? Because just when I get into the church, it's very peaceful. And then all of a sudden I'm out of church and I have to take care of the kids and blah, blah, blah. so but again it's more of a personal thing. Mm -hmm. They were not what I think what I hear you say is that now we're more like taking graphs and things from the newspapers and getting them, engaging them with what's happening. For example, um, in, in Tucson we, we have, of course, like in any other place, you know, things with uh, uh, drug use, homelessness, you know, there are lots of graphs and statistics on that. You know, and, and, and certainly to do more statistics, we, we haven't done a lot of statistics at all, me personally. So. There was a question in the back, way back there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, the presentation was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to deviate slightly. Um, so I, I see the development, and I think it's very powerful use um, you know, real life authentic um, context or matters of concern uh, and, and see how these can be interpreted or influence um, the thinkings and the actions around that. But I, I want to deviate slightly and ask if we are saying, uh, you know, we're acknowledging the, the numeracy practices that that are culturally bounded and stuff like that. Is it possible also for that to talk back to the people? In other words, uh, not for us to, so, so there's a level of us hearing what's happening and trying to say, okay, so what is the mathematics there, you know? But, uh, or, or try to take the mathematics that exists and, and link it to that context. But is there also a possibility to disrupt in itself. So, so the, 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 con the, the stories you hear in the homes, can it um, actually alert us to rethinking the mathematics? Uh, I don't know if I'm making any sense, um, but, but it's, it's, it's not about, uh, okay, so there's one level about taking what we have and seeing how it matches and, and um, but to, to a certain degree, that's mathematizing the context. And I'm asking if, the, if this um, experiences and, 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 and the way mathematics exists 
has the potential, or should we be exploring the potential it has to disrupt what we might be seeing as mathematics in the first place? Um, I don't know if that's... Yes, that's, that's more the work that I've done um, with the children and the, I mean, when I, the force of knowledge, uh, you know, because this is more the work that I've with mothers, which, uh, which is this idea of, which I, I brought up at the beginning, that what is it that we count as mathematics? And is it, are things covered by our views of mathematics? And, and therefore, are we trying to fit in what we see in the home into academic or school mathematics? Or are we actually trying to see, no, these are many, there are many forms of mathematics and we should be uh, um, working with all these forms. I don't know if that's where you're, and, and these are some tensions for me and some dilemmas because on one hand, when I work with children, we want the children to be able to succeed in a school, even though we might not agree with what it means to succeed in a school, right? Um, so that's one area. But also the other area is my own ignorance. I might not be able to know what to do with what I see in the home, because I don't recognize that as mathematical practices. I have a colleague who is very good at doing these interviews and doing these things because he has experience himself in the practices of many of these, you know. He, he, knows, he knows carpentry, he knows how to construct homes, he knows how to, he knows how to solve the old, you know, things. And so that brings a different, he can see things in different ways and at the same time he knows the academic mathematics. So the, for me there is a tension there, but, but I think I, I know, I mean I agree with you. The idea is not, Certainly the idea is not to use the context from the home just as an excuse to then say, oh, look, you know a lot about construction. Now, let me show you a 3 geometry based on, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not the point. No. Yeah. I think there was one more question. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can talk to you later. I'm okay. going to say this, that when I taught in the adult classroom in Washington, D.C., I've used stuff from the census. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have great yeah. charts that are sometimes very difficult to read. Mm -hmm. And um, think, having people figure, you know, here's a chart, what do you think it means, and talking Ooh. about it, coming up with ways to interpret it, and personal stuff coming yeah. up around it. Yeah, I think we did a little bit of that with the war when, when Javi was there, in nursery with him, but, but we haven't done it recently because it's been more tied to young children, parents of young children. Yeah. So. All right. Oh, yeah. One more question. I just want to say, in one of defense, Washington has come to ALM for such a business. They always faithfully pay for students. So, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>